All right, I want us to think back a little bit. Um, as a child, when you were a child, where did you go for answers? Maybe mom and dad? Uh, hopefully it wasn't a little friend because you're probably the same age, and usually that's not good to get some advice. Uh, as a teenager, you know, who was, our, who was your go-to person uh, to get advice from? And wherever you are now, do you have someone that you go to to get the answers that you may need? Uh, when Moses didn't know what to do with the Israelites in the wilderness, he went to his father-in-law Jethro, who told him how to organize the people more function, just to people to function more effectively. When David became the king of Israel, it says that he sought out the sons of Issachar, who had an understanding of the times. In 2 Chronicles, King Rehoboam wrecked the nation by listening to the wrong advisors. So he went to got the wrong counsel. And in the early church, we see that the Apostle Paul sent men like Titus and Timothy to advise and mentor struggling young churches. And in the book of Proverbs, Solomon tells us over and over about the importance of seeking good counsel. So seeking good counsel, you know, we all need that in our lives and it's true for each of us. But and sometimes, because sometimes we just need different advice. We need advice regarding our careers, uh, marital counseling, financial advice, maybe even legal counseling. And it's important for us to find the right people to give us the right advice. When we don't know the answers, we need to find somebody who may know the answers that can help us. But as Christians, we know that we can seek the wisest person in the universe. The psalmist said, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. We know that, he, that God is omniscient. We know that he knows everything. He has all the answers. He knows all of the solutions. He can resolve all difficulties. So what happens when we pray and it seems like there is no answer? What do we do when it seems like God is not answering our prayers? There was a funny story, and I'm saying funny, I'm setting it up because you guys have to laugh after I tell the story, okay? All right. There was a story about a pastor who had a five-year-old daughter, and the girl noticed that every time her dad was getting ready to preach, he would bow his head for a moment before he began. The little girl noticed that he did this every single time. So one day after church, the little girl went to her dad and asked, Dad, why do you bow your head right before you preach your sermon? The pastor said, well, honey, I'm asking the Lord to help me to preach a good sermon. Then the little girl looked at up her father and asked, so how come he doesn't do it? <laughs> uh, I'm like, if my daughter said that, I'm like, you're grounded for two weeks, you know? <laughs> now, when I'm talking about God not answering prayers, I'm not talking about the prayers that, you know, he might answer it, but they're the answers we don't like, because at least that's an answer. And that happens a lot because we know that his ways are not our ways. But I'm talking about the times when we pray and it just seems like nothing is happening. We pray and pray and pray and it seems like there's just no movement at all. We pray and pray and pray and it seems like we're all alone because it's just like there's nothing, nothing coming. And then for me, sometimes it's like, wait a minute, it's like, God, you are a heavenly father and we're taught that you want this relationship with us. You want us to come to you. You care about every little thing in my life. You created me with a plan and a purpose and a will for my life. So if all that is true, why does it seem like God is silent sometimes? Does ever think about that? Why does it seem like God is silent sometimes? And the truth is that sometimes our Heavenly Father is quiet. And when he is, it's really easy to become confused and discouraged, wondering if the Lord has rejected us. When that happens, we have to remember that we serve a good, good father and that he has a good purpose for his silence, right? Remember, after 70 years of captivity in Babylon, the Lord allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem to build the temple and the city walls. We know that story from Nehemiah. 
But after that, it says there was revival in Israel. The people committed once again to serving God and they committed to obeying his commands. But we also know that unfortunately, that didn't last long. And so the priests began failing in their service to the Lord and God rebuked them through, through the prophet Malachi. And in Malachi 2, it says this, it says, you have turned aside from the way you have, caught, you have caused many to stumble by the instruction. So I've made you despise and abase before all the people. Like the generations before them, the Israelites fell into their old patterns of disobedience. How many of you guys know it's hard to break patterns in our lives, even if they're not good for us? This time, though, the Lord decided to treat them differently. After admonishing the people through the prophet Malachi, it says that he grew quiet. No other prophet, priest, judge, or king arose to make sure that the Israelites stayed on track. God stopped speaking and did not say anything for 400 years. 400 years. So what happened? Did they sin so badly that God gave up on them? I used to worry about that when I was younger. Can, did, did they get so angry? Did, he, did God get so angry that he walked away from them? That he stopped working on their behalf? You ever had those kind of thoughts? Thankfully, we know that none of that is true. Because during those four quiet centuries, God was setting the stage for the Savior of the world to come to redeem mankind. And in Malachi's time, we got to understand that there was no common language to spread the gospel worldwide. There wasn't a common language. Alexander the Great began defeating one empire after another. And with that, he brought in Greek culture and language, and he made it a standard for science, philosophy, and commerce. So by the time Jesus was born, communicating the gospel was a lot easier because there was this common language. The Jews even translated the Old Testament into Greek, and that's called the Septuagint. This made the scriptures more accessible the Jews even, and then they, they, then with the rise of the Roman Empire, they improved the roads. And so there was, during this time of peace, so this made it easier to go between towns and cities for evangelists to make disciples of all nations. And finally, Jews were scattered all throughout the Roman provinces, and they had established synagogues. So these are places for people to assemble, to pray, and to study scripture. And this gave missionaries places to reach Jewish communities with the gospel and to preach. So by the time Jesus rose from the dead, the world was prepared with important ways to communicate and receive the gospel. See, see for 400 years, God was silent but he was not unengaged. There's a difference. God may be silent sometimes when we're praying, but he is always engaged in your life. There's never a time where he is unengaged. So no matter how much we love our Heavenly Father, the sinful nature within us will always lead us to rebel against him. And rather than ignoring the Israelites through his silence, God was working on setting them free from sin once and for all through Jesus. There was a purpose for his silence. See, and there are times where it may seem like God is not answering our prayers. And we have to remember, he's not angry with you. He's not angry with us. He hasn't stopped loving us. If he's silent then more than likely there's something he's trying to teach us. 
Now, I want to take a look back at some ways of how God uses silence. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. This isn't like every single reason. But these are just some examples, three ways that why our prayers may not be answered. All right. First is this. God may be preparing us to obey him. He might be preparing us to obey him. In Hebrews 13, it says, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, peace is so much of God, part of God's plan that he's called the God of peace. And the God of peace is constantly and consistently preparing us with everything good to do his will. He's working in us what's pleasing to him. See, sometimes God is silent when we ask him about a significant decision or maybe a trial that we're going through. Now watch this, because he knows the distance causes us to seek him more passionately. His desire is for us to reach a point where we are ready and eager to obey him. And when we're ready and eager to obey him, we're, we're ready when we come to the end of ourselves and our own way of doing things and our own solutions. That's when we're ready to really listen to him. And that's the point where we acknowledge that he is Lord and that he knows what's best for us. After our time of intensely seeking his direction, that's when he starts to reward our prayers and answer our prayers. And he gives us the guidance that we've asked him to provide. So he might be preparing us to obey him. Another reason God may use silence is that he's revealing our sin. In Psalm 66, it says, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So there is a time where God will not hear our prayers. The Lord will not have listened. Our Heavenly Father wants to make us aware of sin in our lives. Now notice it doesn't say, if I sin, the Lord would not have listened. Because if that was the case, we might as well not even pray at all, because we all sin all the time, Right? Our prayers would do no good. That's not what he's saying here. What he's saying is that it's referring to the person who knows there's a particular sin in their life and isn't doing anything about it. This isn't someone who struggles, right? That's different. So we all struggle. We all have those one or two things that we struggle with constantly. That's not what this is referring to either. This is talking about somebody who's willful and unrepentant. They, and they know it's in their life, but they're, they're willfully doing it, even though they know it's against God's will, and they're unrepentant about it. This is a person who has sin in their heart, loves it, and makes excuses about it. And we got to understand, it's not the sin that's necessarily keeping us from getting our prayers unanswered. It's the love for it and the excuses because when, we're, when we do that, we're basically pushing God away. An example of this could be unforgiveness. Right? And this is a hard one, right? Because people hurt us. People have, have said things to us, have done stuff to us. And it's one thing, again, if we're struggling with that, of forgiving somebody, we're struggling, we're like, God, I want to forgive, but I don't know how. I'm so hurt. That's, that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about, you know, no, I'm going to hold it as a badge of honor because I deserve it, because they hurt me. And I'm never going to forgive them for what they've done to me. That's what this is more referring to. Because when we're doing that, we're, 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 we're pushing God away and we're saying, we're basically essentially saying, God, I don't want to give this to you. I don't want you to heal my heart. I don't want you to heal this relationship. I don't need you in this, God. And so he's like, okay, then 
I won't answer your prayers. Because you're willfully holding on to this. And again, there's a difference between that and struggling with it. See, he knows how much we hurt and he wants us to, he wants us to forgive so that we can be free from that hurt so he can answer our prayers. And that's just one example. But what is the willful sin in our life that we're holding on to? Again, it's not that not, we're struggling. I want to make that very clear. We struggle and we come to God a million times, but we're go- the point is we're going to him, right? We're constantly saying, God, forgive me, forgive me. I'm struggling with this again. I'm struggling with this. That's not what this is talking about. There's a difference. It's the one that we're holding on to and we're unrepentant about. All right, and then last, that sometimes God doesn't answer prayers and he's just silence because he's growing our trust in him. In Psalm 62, it says, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. We know that God wants us to trust him. He wants all of our heart. He wants to look at him as a place of refuge and shelter or protection and as a place of safety. And he wants us to trust him even when we're not hearing from him. Sometimes as we desire to honor God, We're afraid to trust God. Now, now, now listen to this. The place where we worry the most is the place where we trust God the least. Think about that. The place where we worry the most is the place where we're trusting God the least. The places where we do trust God, they're full of peace. Right? Right? Even though there are trials or tribulations, but we're trusting God with that, we have more peace about that situation. But the places where we're trusting least is where we're so worried about it, we're holding on to it, we're not trusting Him. By choosing to be silent, God may be testing how deeply we believe in Him and how much we will cling to His promises in His Word. He may be testing us. And, and, and he knows, right? He himself knows how strong or how weak our trust is in him. But what he's doing is he's revealing it to us. He's showing us, hey, you're trusting me here. You're not trusting me over here. If God immediately said yes to all of our prayers, we can easily fall into the trap thinking that his answers are based on our righteousness and not his mercy and grace. So while waiting, he's building a stronger foundation in all of us. He's using, remember, there's a purpose. And this foundation is one that will endure through all persecutions and trials. Because how many of you know life is full of persecutions and trials? And so, but if, we, if our foundation is built on Christ, then, then we're good. And so he's always growing our trust in him and who he is. Not on our strength. Not on our righteousness. But on everything about who he is. See, he's a good, good father. And he wants what's best for each and every situation. We know that he speaks. We know that he answers prayer. And he gives us the Holy Spirit who prays for us and is in constant communication within us. But have you ever experienced a time where it seems like the Lord is silent? It can be frustrating, especially when we need answers quickly. Whenever there's a time of silence and it seems like our prayers aren't being answered, we have to remind ourselves that it's an opportunity to learn something here. He's trying to teach us something. So quickly, I'm going to give you three things that we can do. You know, what do I do when my prayers aren't answered? There's three things that we can do that that might help with this. And number one, it's like the simplest thing. It's so simple, but I don't think many people do it. Ask the Lord why he's quiet. It's pretty simple. Ask him. Well, you might think, well, he's quiet. He's probably not going to answer. He may or may not, but ask him. 
God, you know, what's going on? David understood this in Psalm 13. He says, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? David was wrestling with that too. And David was one of the more well-known names in the Old Testament. We know, what do we know about David? He loved God deeply. He loved people. There was even a description about him that he was a man after God's own heart. He would eventually become king of Israel. And before that, we know that, that, that he became king. He served a King Saul, who we know was not a good king because he feared man more than he feared God. And David defeated Goliath and he rose quickly amongst the ranks and God gave him favor. So anytime he went to battle, him and his troops always won. And so he had so many victories, they started singing songs about him. And Saul heard all this, even though he was king, he gets jealous of David and he tries to kill David. And we know that David ran and ran and ran for years with his family and, and followers. And even though all this was happening to David and it wasn't right and it wasn't fair, David still stood faithful to the Lord. But it doesn't mean he didn't struggle. Sooner or later, most of God's people will feel like he has forgotten him. Sooner or later, we're all going to feel that way, that God has forgotten us. He had to be wondering, God, why is this happening to me? Why was God allowing this and not answering his prayers? And so this was David's plea to the Lord as he was working through his emotions, his feelings. You know, how long, Lord? How long? Will you forget me forever? And David, remember, David shared this special relationship with the Lord, and, and yet here's, here's David even crying out, how long? How long must, must I wrestle with my thoughts day after day and have sorrow in my heart? But the good news is that he was speaking to the Lord. He was still speaking to God. He didn't stop praying. He was basically asking him, you know, why was all this happening? And it seems so simple Ask the Lord, right, why he's quiet. But again, how many people do that? When we pray and he's quiet, usually we do one of two things. Usually we get upset and we receive it as rejection. Or we stop praying and thinking, well, what good is it doing anyways? Because he's not hearing my prayers. But a better option is to ask him, God, why are you so silent when I need you? Keep talking to him. And if you listen closely, he just might reveal to you the why. And he will definitely reveal to you the why if it's a sin issue in your heart that's hindering your prayers. Because he wants to bring us to repentance to get that thing out of there. And if it is a sin issue, it's, it's easy sometimes, to repent, turn away from it, and just seek God and allow God to come in and heal that place. If he's preparing us to obey him or growing our trust in him, then the answer is this, is just trust him and just embrace the process. We may not like the process that he has us in, but what are we going to do? What, what, are the, what are our options? Just embrace the process and trust him through the process that he has us in. All right, now the other thing we can do is this, is that we can recall the Lord's faithfulness. In Joshua 4, it says, Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. See, the Israelites, they would set up altars, not necessarily for sacrifice, but to mark and remember important events. Times when they saw God's faithfulness to them. 
And in Joshua chapter four, you know, God, par- God um, parted the river Jordan for the Israelites to cross it. And together they built an altar of 12 stones, one for each tribe. And Joshua said this to the Israelites. He says, in the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them. Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground for the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful so that you might always fear the Lord your God. In other words, he was saying, we're going to set up these stones because one day we're going to tell our kids about it because we're going to recall the Lord's faithfulness during that time. See, and this is challenging for us because we can be so forgetful, right? How many times has God done something in my life and I'm amazed and I'm thankful. I'm like, oh, thank you, God, so much. Only to forget about it two weeks later. There was a story about a gal who, much like this, she wrote that she had developed this repetitive kind of strain injury in her hand. And it lasted for years. It lasted for college because she used to like to write. She used to journal. She used to write. She would get physical therapy. She would take pain meds just to, to, you know, kind of live with it. And one night she goes to a church meeting and some lady came up to her and noticed, you know, this, this brace in her hand that she used to wear and, and said, can I pray for you? And she's like, yeah, yeah, please pray for me. You know, she goes, because she, she thought to herself, there's plenty of times where I prayed and it seemed to work, seemed to at least lessen the pain. So yes, please, you know, what, what, what could it hurt? And so this lady prays for her and she realized that on the way home, all the pain was gone. And she gets home She's going to write again. And so she puts on her splint and the pain comes back. And she just, she, she, no, wait a minute, the pain's back. So she decided to take the splint off again and just start writing with it, without it. And all of a sudden the pain was gone. And she kept writing for hours and the pain was gone and it never came back. So of course, She's praising God for this. She's excited. She's praising God. She's just thankful. And she said that every time over the next few weeks, she'd get a pen to write. She would just praise God and be thankful for it. And at times she went to go pick up a coffee cup and her her hand didn't hurt. She would praise God for it. But she admitted that this lasted just a few weeks. And then after that, she just forgot about it. You know, she forgot. And then until she read the story in Joshua... And it just reminded her of God's faithfulness in her life, right? Whenever we go through things, whenever God seems silent, we have to recall his faithfulness in our life. You know, we've all been through some sort of story and, you know, we've some, something in our lives where, where God has been faithful. And it's during those times where God, when he seems silent, our prayers aren't, aren't being answered, we have to remind ourselves over and over you know, we have to go to these kinds of stories in the Bible. I know that whenever I feel discouraged, I'm like, God, where are you? I'll go to these stories and I'll read them over and over and over to build my faith and to put my focus on him and my trust on him. I'll rehearse the stories of all the times throughout my life of what he's done in my life. With God, you showed up here, you showed up here, you showed up here. I'll rehearse all those. I'll think about those things. God, you are faithful and I'll recall his faithfulness. Because I refuse to let the lies of the enemy take place in my heart that God has abandoned me. I refuse that. I refuse to let that get in my heart. Because that is not truth. That is a lie from the enemy. He has not abandoned us whenever our prayers go unanswered. He is still engaged in our lives. And then the third point is this, is that, and this is kind of a, a, a point from, last, from the other day, from the other week. Commit to close the door. In Lamentations, it says, The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. 
The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. If your hope is in him, he is good to you. If you seek him, he is good to you. It is good to wait quietly and God's going to come. Lamentation, scholars believe, was written by the prophet Jeremiah, who was known as the weeping prophet because of his passion for the people. And when you lament, you're basically, you're, you're, it's a passionate expression of grief and sorrow. See, Judah had committed idolatry by worshiping other gods, and they were unrepentant. There's that unrepentance again. So God allowed the Babylonians to come in and plunder and destroy the city of Jerusalem. And Solomon's temple had stood for 400 years, was burned to the ground. And the prophet Jeremiah witnessed all of this. So they say that he's the one who wrote Lamentations. But he understood that the Babylonians were God's tool for bringing judgment because of their sin and rebellion. But even through all of this, Jeremiah understood that God is a God of hope. That no matter how far we have gone from him, we have the hope that we can return to him and find him compassionate and forgiving. Our God is a loving God. His faithfulness and his deliverance are attributes that can give us hope and comfort. So whether you hear his voice or not, commit to being quiet before the Lord. More than what you would normally do during these times. Read your Bible. Tell him you are available to listen and wait silently for him to speak. Make him a priority in your life. And eventually, you'll have a breakthrough and you'll hear God and your prayers will be answered. But, but also keep this in mind. When God is silent, sometimes, sometimes he's trying to bring us into a new level of intimacy with him. Sometimes he wants us to bring us closer to him. I always picture him like, with, with, you know, with the prophet, you know, he just it came in a still, small voice, he's whispering. And the only way you can hear him is if you get near him, you get close to him. Sometimes he's silent because he's trying to draw us in so that we can get closer to him. And you may be in a season where he's asking for more and more of your time. If he's silent, he may be asking for more and more of your time during that season more than what you normally give. And what you're doing now may not be enough. When we do that, sometimes we might discover that he was speaking and answering our prayers, but we just couldn't hear him because of all the busyness and all the noise. See, we, try, we get into routines and we like business as usual. But there, we know life's not like that, right? Ups and downs hills and valleys. And sometimes we need to, there are seasons where we need to draw closer to the Lord. And sometimes how you silence for tickets to do that, to seek him more, to pursue him more, to listen more tentatively, to be more intentional about it, to, to, to refocus us, recalibrate us towards him. When this happens, we have to look at this as an opportunity to humble ourselves, to get on our knees, and to acknowledge that he is the Lord of our life. Now, the, these prayer messages we've been talking about, these aren't meant to give us every answer. And even today, it's not meant to give us every answer to why God can be silent and he's not answering our prayers. You know, one of the things that this still troubles me is that we'll never understand why God heals somebody and so many others he doesn't. I don't get that. I don't understand that. There's somebody that I know that they have, this, that they have a gift and you know, they can pray over people, people get healed. And, and even with that gift, they, he tracks everything. And he says that only 20% of people he prays for get healed. What about the other 80%? I don't get that. I don't understand why God chooses. That doesn't make sense to me. We'll never understand everything. We 
we'll never have all the answers to the why questions we have. Why did God do this? Why does he allow that? But I think what's just as important as what we do when he's God and, and what he does is that when we don't understand, I mean, what are our options? What are our options? Walk away? Get angry at him? Or should we lean in even more to him and trust that he knows what's best for us? So what do we do when our prayer is going answered? Uh, first, ask the Lord, why are you so quiet, God? Recall his faithfulness in your life. And if you're newer, pursue him. If you don't have that many faithful stories, get into God's word and you'll see his faithfulness over and over again. And pretty soon you'll have your own stories too to add to that of God's faithfulness in your life. Maybe how he showed up in your kid's life and your friend's life because you prayed. And then if anything, just commit to close the door. Seek him even more. Pray more. Pursue him more. Lean into him even more. Get quiet before him. And just wait for him. And do this consistently, persistently. And God will respond. So what do we do when your prayers aren't answered? That's what you do. Let me pray for us, okay? God, you are God. There is nobody like you. You do not have to answer to us. Even when Job questioned you, you did not answer him. You turned it around and says, like, who are you? God, we don't always know why our prayers seem like they're unanswered. Maybe they're a, a not yet. Maybe they're a wait. Maybe they're just no, we're not hearing it. But you know that there are times where we can get frustrated. We can, it feels like rejection. It feels like you, like you don't love us. God, would you help us through those times? Would you strengthen us to those times? Would you even remind us of your faithfulness? When we are weak, would you be strong for us? Would you give us this, this hunger and desire stirred up within us just to seek you more? to pursue you more, to lean into you more when everything within us feels like doing the opposite. And Lord, I pray that you would just help us keep our focus on you, especially when we don't understand. Thank you, Jesus.